Here's a probability question. Let's suppose we have a piece of code that can generate a random face. These are some random faces generated by the lovely site thispersondoesnotexist.com. Let's also suppose we have some neural network classifier which takes in a face and guesses the mood of the person. These sorts of classifiers usually return a set of probabilities. It might say, for example, I guess this face is happy with probability 80%, sad with probability 15%, and so on. Now, here's a question. How might we generate a random happy face? If you think like a programmer, you might say, easy. I'll just keep generating faces, feed them into the mood classifier, and if the happy score comes out high, I'll stop and return that face. And then someone asks you, how high does the score have to be? And you say, uh, I'll leave it as a parameter that the user can set to hide the fact that you have no idea. If you set the threshold too high, then your routine will be slow because maybe not too many faces are happy. And if you set it too low, you'll let too many unhappy faces through. OK, so the naive programmer's approach has some issues. Let's try and be clever and think like a probabilistic modeler. We might say the mood classifier returns a vector of probabilities. So let's define a discrete random variable y, which takes value happy with probability 80% in this case, sad with probability 15%, and so on. This, by the way, is called the categorical distribution. Then we can interpret the question as asking for a conditional probability. If big X is a random face, we just want the conditional random variable X conditional on Y equals happy. In terms of the likelihood function, we want the likelihood of an arbitrary face little x conditional on Y equals happy. Bayes' rule tells us how to work out a conditional likelihood. So we're done, we've solved the problem. Probability modeling is lovely because once we can learn to express our questions in a language of probability, then all sorts of things just magically resolve themselves. Here we don't have any nasty arbitrary threshold parameters to choose. But, and there is always a but, the answer we just gave, find the conditional likelihood using Bayes' rule, is just plain useless because A is usually intractable to apply Bayes' rule, and B, even though we could derive the conditional likelihood, we still don't know how to sample from it. And the question asked us, how should we generate a random face? It didn't ask us, what's the likelihood of a given face x? The happy path is to combine the two approaches. Take a little bit of the programmer spirit that says, hey, I have code that can generate x's, let's use it. And take some of the mathematician spirit, which has a very deep and rigorous understanding of what conditioning means. When we do this, when we combine the programmer and the mathematician, we get computational Bayes' theorem which is the topic of this video. The technique we're going to see is very, very simple to use. It's just four lines of code, but there's so much thinking behind it, and that's the real focus of the video, to get you to understand intuitively why those four lines of code are the right thing to do. Let's just start with a refresher on conditional distributions. Here's a pair of random variables, x, y, written in code and also shown as a joint likelihood plot. This code first generates x uniformly in range minus 1 to 1, and the top plot shows the marginal distribution of x. Now, remember the big idea of conditional distributions. If we take a horizontal slice through the joint likelihood, let's say we take a slice at y equals 0.2, and then we rescale this slice so it integrates to 1, what we get is the conditional likelihood of x conditional on y equals 0.2. OK, so that's a refresher about what conditional distributions are. Now, let's look at the computational Bayes method. Here are the steps to use. First step, generate a sample x1 up to xn from the x distribution. His code to generate a sample of size n equals 1000. I'm plotting the sampled values here, one vertical stroke for each of the xi. This type of plot is called a rug plot because it looks like the tufts on a rug. Next step, we compute a weight wi for each one of these sampled x values. Let wi 
be the conditional likelihood of the observed y value conditional on x taking value little xi. And we'll rescale the weights so they sum to 1. Here it is in code. In this particular example, y is normally distributed with mean x squared, so I let w be the PDF of the normal distribution with mean x squared. And I'm evaluating the PDF at y equals 0.2, the y value that we're conditioning on in this picture. In the diagram on the right, I'm showing the sampled x values again, but this time I'm color coding them by the weight wi. Now we have sampled x values and each xi has an associated weight wi and the rule for approximating conditional probabilities is simply this. The probability that x lies in some set A, conditional on the observed value y, is the sum over the sample points xi that fall in set A, the sum of the corresponding weights wi, here written with indicator notation. Let's make that a bit more explicit. Let's say I want to plot a histogram of the conditional distribution of x conditional on y. To plot a histogram, what I do is I'd first split the x-axis into bins. Let's call them bin 1 up to bin m. Then for each bin, I want to know what's the probability that x falls into that bin. The rule in step 3 says the conditional probability that x falls into some particular bin is the sum over all sampled values little xi in that bin of their weight wi. When I simply apply that, it gives me the histogram here. In fact, this is just a one-liner. Matplotlib has a built-in function plot.hist which accepts a list of weights and it just adds up the weights for each bin and plots the total. And I'm just doing one extra little thing in this plot. I use the argument density equals true, which rescales the bar heights so that the total area of the plot is equal to 1. This is called a density histogram and it's convenient because then the y-axis is directly comparable to the PDF plot. You can see here the histogram we get looks very similar to the PDF on the left-hand side and the scales are the same. Now you might be able to work out from these pictures why the computational procedure works. This picture might perhaps be a bit misleading though because I've chosen a uniform distribution for x in this example. But the procedure works whatever the distribution and at the end of this video we're going to see a proof. Just two more things to take note of though. First, there's also a conditional expectation version of this formula. If I want to work out the expected value of some readout function h of x conditional on y, I take the weighted sum of h of xi. You'll remember from the last video about Monte Carlo this idea of expectations of readout functions. In that video, we saw that the probability formula is in fact just a special case of the expectation formula. The next thing to say is this method I've described here is just one way of doing Bayes' rule with a computer. It's a brute force method. It's really simple and you can use it everywhere, but sometimes it takes very many samples for it to be a good approximation. Basically, any specialist field of machine learning will have its own specialized numerical methods, and it's just the same with Bayesian machine learning. There are other more sophisticated ways of applying Bayes' rule that people have come up with. There's one particular method called Gibbs sampling that you're going to come across in later courses. But for now, I just want to focus on this simple, basic three-step method. Let's work through another example. Here's the question. Consider the following probability model, which has two random variables, theta and y. Suppose we've observed the value of y and we want to know the likely range of theta conditional on y. Let's just apply the three-step method. Step 1. Generate a sample of x values. Actually, in this problem, the variables are theta and y, not x and y, so I want a sample of theta values. I'll call them theta sump. Step 2. Compute the weights based on the conditional likelihood of y. The question tells us how y was generated. It says y is binomial with parameters 3 and theta. So this formula here is its likelihood. 
Now just evaluate the likelihood at each of the sampled theta values. We might as well ignore the 3 choose y factor at the front because it doesn't depend on theta, so it will cancel out when we rescale the weights to sum up to 1. Step 3. Whatever we want to report about the conditional distribution of theta, report it via this weighted sample. Here I'm plotting a density histogram to show the conditional distribution of theta, and I'm also showing an unweighted histogram to show me the original distribution, which was uniform. OK, well, that's all there is to computational Bayes. Now we have nearly everything we need to answer the question we posed at the beginning of this video. Let's just repeat. Suppose we have code that can generate random faces, and suppose we have a mood classifier that guesses the mood of a face and which returns a list of scores for each mood, which we'll interpret as a categorical random variable. We imagine that the true mood is a random variable big Y, probability that the true mood, the mood of this particular face little x, the probability it's happy is 0.8 and so on. We posed a question at the beginning of the video, how to generate a random happy face. Actually, before answering this question, I want to answer a second question. Let's suppose we have a function that predicts the age of a given face. And let's imagine I want to ask, what age are people happy? Here's how we could use computational Bayes. First step, generate a random sample of faces. Next, compute a weight for each face in our sample. The weight should be the likelihood of the outcome y equals happy for a particular face, little xi. Next, the question asks us, what age are people happy? Which we can interpret as a conditional expectation. We'll interpret it as find the expected value of the age function h of x, conditional on the outcome y equals happy. And computational Bayes says that we can approximate it by this weighted sum here. OK. So that's exactly the standard steps we've laid out for any computational Bayes question. All we needed was to be a little bit clever about how to frame the question as an expectation. But the other question is actually something a bit new. It's not asking for an expectation or a probability. It's asking how should we generate a random happy face? For now, I'm just going to state the answer. We generate a sample of faces, as in the second question, and then we choose one of the faces at random, but not uniformly at random. Instead, use W as the weights for the choice. Maybe it's obvious to you that this is the sensible thing to do, or maybe it's one of those things that's on the tip of your brain. It seems nearly obvious, but you can't quite pin down exactly why. The reason why it's the right thing to do is something that we're going to come back to later on in this course in section 6. OK, so this is computational Bayes. Let's just take a step back and think again about why we're doing it. We're looking at computational Bayes because the mathematical way of using Bayes rule often turns out to be intractable. Here's a recap of section 4.2. The first step in applying Bayes' rule mathematically, write down the marginal likelihood function for x. Step 2. Write out the Bayes' rule formula. We usually write it this way with a constant kappa in front. Kappa is whatever it has to be to make this into a legitimate probability density function. And just a reminder of where this formula comes from, it's the product of two likelihoods, the likelihood for x and the conditional likelihood for y, which come together to make the joint likelihood function. We're taking a slice of the joint likelihood function, and we need to rescale it to be a valid PDF, and that's what kappa is for. So now we've found the conditional likelihood of x conditional on y taking a particular value, and we can do whatever we like with it. There are two big gotchas here. The first is that it's usually intractable to find kappa. We saw that in section 4.2, even for what looked like pretty trivial problems. And the second is that sometimes we don't even know the likelihood function for x. In this code snippet here, we know exactly what the likelihood for x is, because x is a simple uniform random variable. But in the example from the beginning of this video, where we called x equals random dot face, 
there's no way we could ever write down any sort of useful likelihood function. Computational Bayes is what comes to the rescue in both these cases, either where you can't find kappa or where you don't even know the likelihood function for x. To finish off this video, I want to look at the derivation of the computational Bayes method. You certainly don't need to know this, but I'm just including it here because it's fairly simple and because it's nice to see how it drops out of Monte Carlo. First, we'll only bother deriving the formula for conditional expectation. We saw in the last video on Monte Carlo that the formula for conditional probability is just a special case of this, so this is all we need to derive. Here's the argument. We start off with the expectation we want to work out. Then I've written it as an integral. This is just the definition of expectation, an integral of the quantity we want times the likelihood for the random variable we're using. Next, I'm using Bayes' rule to tell me what this conditional likelihood is. I'm leaving it here with a constant kappa to be determined. Next step is just a simple rewrite. The thing we want to integrate has a term likelihood of x, which I'm going to keep I'm going to gather everything else into a single function, call it g. So what we've produced is the integral of g of x times the likelihood of x, which can be rewritten as just the expected value of g of big X. Finally, Monte Carlo tells us that we can approximate it by the average of g of xi, where the xi are a sample drawn from random variable x. Now, the formula for g here involves this constant kappa, so let's turn to kappa. Kappa is whatever is needed to make the conditional likelihood of x integrate to 1. I've written the algebra here as 1 on kappa equals this integral over x. Let's do the same thing we did before. We'll write it as an integral of some function f times the likelihood of x, in other words, as an expectation. And we can use Monte Carlo once again to approximate this expectation. So let's summarize what we've got to. The conditional expectation that we're after is approximately the mean of g of xi, and plugging in the definition of g, this is what we have. Now, plug in the approximation for kappa. This term in brackets that we've produced here is simply the weights wi, incorporating a rescaling that makes the wi sum to 1. So we get to the answer we wanted. The proof is complete. As I said, you don't need to know how this derivation works to be able to use it, but it's good to see it, and it's good to get a sense of how the Monte Carlo approximation can be used in a more sophisticated setting. By the way, it's completely impossible to take in a proof like this just by looking at it, so what you should do now is write out the two expressions on the left, the conditional expectation and the formula for 1 on kappa, and then turn off the screen and see if you can reproduce all the argument. Videos are great for watching, but you learn maths by doing. OK, so now we know how to apply Bayes' rule. We know how to apply it with maths, and we know how to apply it by computer. The next thing we'll do is we'll see why Bayes' rule is such a useful tool for making sense of the world, for drawing inferences, and for testing hypotheses in the light of data.